The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in beautiful Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, one of the earlier stories that you and I have been covering on this show, dating back at least seven or eight years now, is this question about the donkey trade. And it's one of the persistent stories in the China-Africa relationship that just doesn't seem to change, get better, improve. Yet there's a lot of attention over the years on other aspects of the animal trade and the wildlife trade between China and Africa. There's been a crackdown, as we've talked about many years ago, on ivory. There's still a lot of rhino horn smuggling that's going on and a lot of coverage about that, but very little discussion about the importance of donkeys. And it is impossible to overstate, absolutely impossible to overstate how important donkeys are to so many communities, not just in Africa, But around the world, in rural communities in South America and in the Middle East and elsewhere, donkeys are the center of a family's economic activity in many respects because it does so many functions on the farm. Now, there's a new report that came out by the Association of Donkey Owners of Kenya, and it came out this week, and it was covered quite a bit in the Kenyan press. And I want to bring some shocking numbers to you. Back in 2016, and that's about the time when you and I started to cover this issue, Kenya had 1.8 million donkeys. And what's shocking, according to the association, is that number now has plunged by 800,000 to just a million donkeys. And again, that's just a huge plunge. Now, the association says that the drop is due to the opening of a number of new slaughterhouses that target the animals and also a failure to address breeding and also poaching. And poaching is a very important issue. Now, the association chairman, Albert Naida, he accused in a press conference in Kenya, he accused Chinese factories of buying donkey skins that were illegally poached and that were stolen in, you know, from smallholder farms throughout the country. And so not only is the problem in China for the demand, but also Chinese-owned factories in Kenya, according to the association. So, Kobus, you've been looking at this quite a bit recently. Give us a little bit of background, just for those who may be new to the issue, why donkeys and donkey skins in particular are in such demand. So donkey skins are used to make what's called urja, which is this kind of donkey skin-based gelatin, which is used in traditional Chinese medicine. And that's gone back for a long time. It, you know, dates from hundreds of years ago. But that that industry has recently gotten re-energized. So urja is being marketed very aggressively within China to the to an emerging Chinese middle class uh, as a kind of a tonic, you know, as, as a wellness tonic and a wellness aid, um, particularly for skin beauty. So, you know, the, that trade has really energized this industry in China. But because donkeys, you know, tend to breed very slowly, that means that they quickly ran out of donkeys within China and then started importing donkeys from other parts of the global south. So this is really impacting economies, particularly rural economies all over Africa. And as you as you mentioned, you know, in East Africa, particularly, we're seeing donkey numbers plummet. And with it, it's really taking a massive toll on rural economies across the continent. Now, if this is a story that's of interest to you, and I really recommend that you look into it because it's absolutely fascinating from so many different aspects, there are a couple of different reports that have come out recently, and one that I want to bring your attention to, China, Africa, and the Market for Donkeys, Keeping the Cart Behind the Donkey. It was written by Lauren Johnston, who's a consultant senior researcher in the Foreign Policy Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Lauren has been on our show before, where she's talked about demographics in the China-Africa relationship, and she also authored a column on the topic in Nikkei Asia, China Must Tame Its Donkey Trade for Africa's Sake. Now, you had a chance recently to speak with Lauren about the reports and her column, and it sounds absolutely fascinating. 
Absolutely. She really takes a kind of a broad approach to looking at how the trade has been reshaped within China and then to look at, at the impact um, in Africa. And one of the things that she points out is that the trade is uniquely gendered. It focuses on women in China and it, it tends to disproportionately impact women in Africa. And, you know, kind of with it, the donkey trade then becomes this very revealing kind of glimpse of a lot of the complications within China-Africa trade, and particularly the kind of complications around the marketing of traditional Chinese medicine and the way that that then impacts ar around the world. So it was really fun for me to speak with Lauren. Lauren Johnson, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's great to speak with you. Let's kick off by just kind of setting the scene. On and off, we've been covering the donkey trade between Africa and China, but I think it really is a kind of a niche area within Africa-China relations. So I wonder if we could set the scene by just explaining what is Ejao and how do they actually derive it from donkeys? Thanks so much for having me again, Kobus. It's been about six years. It's great to be back. So... Erjiao is a very well-known traditional Chinese medicine that began being made around 3,000 years ago in Shandong province. And there's in Shandong province, there's a couple of mineral wells. And, you know, Shandong is also the kind of ancient home of Confucius and lots of scholarly traditions and so on. And I believe the black donkey that was then in that area, somehow it became understood that the collagen from a donkey's hide was somehow very rich in properties that could, for example, when mixed with this mineral water that was very rich in other minerals and then some herbs and spices, that that compound would serve as like a wonderful form of estrogen supplementation it would help kind of bring vitality to blood it would help with collagen replacement and collagen creation in the body so therefore help with skin and you know other kind of cartilage or wherever collagen is used and it was an extremely rare and elite product you know made from these the few donkeys in Shandong and that mineral water for thousands of years. And it was, as I understand it, I'm a China-Africa, you know, economist, focus economist, so I'm not a Urjia historian. As I understand it, it was a very labor-intensive process of, you know, literally slaughtering the donkey to get the hide, mixing it in this very long, almost 100-step process, and even very traditionally done on the winter solstice on December 21. So, almost a sort of a pagan aspect to the very original ceremonial angle and then mixes hundred steps to come up with a kind of a cake product that can then just be easily consumed almost as if a sweet. And it was mostly only used by the empresses and a few elites for all those health benefit reasons to support pregnancy, aging, all sorts for all the thousands of years between until around like, the 1990s and 1980s. Well, in the 1980s, the concept of Urja was trademarked. And then in the 1990s, the process of making Urja was mechanized. So this meant much, much, much more Urja could be produced. And then you know, the arrival of air conditioning and the arrival of all year round production process and all sorts that all the different parts of the production process could become a kind of a year-round production machine that was a, on a much bigger scale. So then, and then China joins the WTO in 2001, trade starts to skyrocket, per capita income starts to skyrocket, China's population starts to age, so collagen supplements become more popular, and so on and so on. So by 2010... China, for the first time ever, the Urjiao industry, which to this day is still based in Shandong province, it hasn't really moved from its traditional 3,000-year heartland, started to experience donkey hide constraints. And that turning point around 2010 begins 
a story of China Africa trade around donkeys. So, you know, kind of as you mentioned, like throughout all of this history, China was using, or like the, the Urja industry was using domestic donkeys. So, how did they start importing donkey hides to feed this industry? I think from 2010, when this supply constraint suddenly appeared, like as I understand it from what I've, I've read, there was just a period where, you know, the next donkey hide wasn't arriving. And so that led to the urge out industry to reach out to countries that are rich in donkeys. So China gets some donkeys from Pakistan, one of its neighbors. And, and so on. And then as the industry grew, so, you know, by 2020, this was an $8 billion industry. So really what happened between 2010 and today is an explosion of growth, which meant an explosion of demand for this donkey hide. And I just want to add in a footnote that donkeys are not comparable to a lot of kind of animal-based, sorry, farm-based animals like pigs or sheep. They don't easily mass breed and just keep breeding. They tend to breed, I guess, a bit like humans. They have, you know, one, two, maybe three children. And that's almost it, partly also because they're working, so they can't always be available for breeding. So the donkey isn't a kind of a mass producible animal, which also then facilitates this supply. It's very hard to create a huge donkey farm. So I guess I don't know exactly when the first donkey agreement was signed, like donkey, like a formal donkey hide agreement. So there is an informal donkey hide trade and a formal donkey hide trade. And to be honest, I'm not sure which one came first, if the trade between China and Africa and donkey hides was first informal in terms of donkeys being illegally killed, the hide being stolen and smuggled to China, or if that followed a, a kind of a small quota legal agreement to, say, export 10,000 donkeys from Kenya, and then that in turn produced demand for actually you know 30,000 Kenyan donkeys, which meant the other 20,000 were stolen. I don't know which one came first, but the informal donkey hide trade has become, I guess, the more prominent side of the China-Africa donkey trade over years since, obviously because it has quite dramatic, you know, household effect when they lose the donkey. So I don't know exactly if it started with theft or if it started with an agreement, but by now you have agreements and theft and all sorts of contention. So, you know, that's roughly where we started picking the story up a few years ago, because on the African side, there were all these kind of alarmed reports about donkeys disappearing and the socioeconomic impact, particularly on poor farming communities. But then also there was a, you know, several exposés, particularly a very prominent one in South Africa, of very mistreated donkeys being horribly slaughtered for the international trade, particularly for the trade to China. So it quickly became kind of conflated into wider kind of very critical coverage in Africa of poaching also for traditional Chinese medicine purposes. So I was wondering what you think of that overlap. Like, you know, kind of does it make sense for us to, to talk about the donkey hide trade in the same breath as, say, rhino horn or, you know, kind of lion bone trade? Or do we need a different kind of like delineation of the market? It's such a complex story and it also varies across different countries in Africa because some are easier to smuggle from than others, some are easier to regulate than others. And yes, indeed, the story from South Africa probably has been the most publicly critical. You know, there, there have been social media spillovers into horrible cases of racism around donkey trade and, and so on that have spilled over into innocent third communities. And then the other side, as you've just said, is this donkey welfare story, where as part of this research, I spoke to the National Society for Protection of Animals of South Africa. And, you know, they were telling me about some of their visits to legal and illegal or kind of donkey slaughter locations. And the gap between a donkey being slaughtered legally and illegally is very, 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 very different for donkey welfare indeed. So the illegal slaughter is highly, highly inhumane to donkeys, which are believed to be quite sensitive and intelligent animals. On the question of the links between the wildlife trade 
and the donkey trade, you know, it's such a kind of interesting nexus because a lot of the trade is illegal or at least some of this high socioeconomic impact trade is illegal and therefore it can often be found as you were just saying even you know from Nigeria to South Africa in the same shipments with rhino horn with illegally traded lion bones so it is found in the same illegal shipments yet unlike for example, rhino horns, there is a legal and agreed quota for, for trade of donkeys between China and some countries in Africa. So it isn't perfectly comparable, even though there is that crossover of practical shipment and illegal trade. But I also think there's a huge difference in that rhinos and elephants, for example, don't live with households, let alone do they serve and support the poorest households? So when an elephant or rhino is killed, this is one type of loss that is really an environmental loss and a conservation loss. Whereas when the donkey disappears, it's a very human family socioeconomic loss. And so I think the way the politics of the illegal trade of donkeys and the illegal trade of animals is quite different because this is really touching the heart of social mobility of the poorest and women to be supported carrying water over long distances and wood over long distances and in cases even you know children being taken to school on the donkey or the sick being taken to hospital on the donkey so when the donkey's gone an amazing array of very basic everyday today services disappear. That's not the case with the rhinos and elephants. So even though there is that crossover, the human impact is incredibly different. And therefore, the politics of donkeys might be a little more emotive again and a little more kind of felt from the soul so I myself first learned of this trade really in 2017 in Ethiopia. I was around both Gondar and Lalibala and I heard people complaining about, you know, I was studying China-Africa trade at the time in industries and people just were complaining about this donkey trade because of all of those human impacts. And, you know, Ethiopia is very Christian and the donkey carried Mary and, you know, when she was pregnant, it has all these symbols. So to steal the donkey is still a little different to stealing a or killing a giraffe. There's something a bit bigger and more spiritual, and it just touches the poor so deeply. Absolutely. And the stories is particularly heartbreaking, the kind of stories of people whose donkeys were kind of stolen in the middle of the night, you know, it was really upsetting. Do you, can I just add something there, Kobus? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Last night I had dinner with Patrick Aman of Development Reimagined, who's based in Nairobi. And into this story, he was telling me about in like remote areas, the donkey's not just providing all those economic and physical labor services, especially to women, but at night, apparently the donkey also provides a bit of security. So if anyone comes kind of rustling around a house in the evening, apparently a donkey is quite aggressive as a to chase away those kind of hustlers or whoever's rustling around. It's an incredibly good source of security. So also when the donkey is gone, the family becomes much more exposed to even more risk of theft and loss and so on. Do we have any kind of, has, has anyone done any kind of quantified research about what the broader economic impact of, the, of a wide-scale loss of donkeys has been so far in rural Africa? There's a UK think tank or UK donkey charity called the Donkey Sanctuary. And there's an East African donkey charity, I guess, called Brooks. And these two think tanks, charities, produce a bit of research on that. But it tends to be a little survey based, like not a deep kind of randomized control trial type super quantitative study of what the impact is or you know any equivalent study and so I wouldn't say there are really clear figures but there are some anecdotal stories and people are starting to do just kind of they go to families and they try to 
talk to them about what they've lost or, you know, that, for example, where a woman used to be able to work off the farm because the donkey could support a woman to go and get the water and the firewood and take the children to school very quickly. So then she had, you know, five hours to go and work on a cotton farm or something. Once the donkey's gone, it takes her almost all day to do that herself. Or she has to pull, you know, her daughter out of school or something. So there's these huge long run implications where children lose their education in particular, especially girls. But I haven't actually seen like a solid, deep kind of economics paper estimate of the economic impact. But there's an enormous amount of or an increasing amount of kind of small scale surveys of communities in Kenya or Ghana or South Africa, even Tanzania, but nothing that's in a kind of economics journal so far. If we shift back to China, as you said, it started off as a super, super elite product and then started kind of jumping into like a, a, a contemporary consumer markets. And in your paper, one, one of the fascinating details that you mentioned in the paper is that a TV series was partly the help to fuel this kind of vogue for Erjo in China. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the development of the middle class consumer market for Erjo over the last decade or two. Good question. I think this mechanation of the production process of Urjo really opened up the industry, which is dominated by just maybe three players based in a small area of Shandong. Once they could mass produce continually all year, then they almost needed to create a bigger market. Once they, they had the kind of supply, but they needed the demand. And over the 2000s, as we were saying, like per capita income in China increased quite rapidly. And so then I'm not sure what year the TV series started. I think it was called The Empresses. And it was a, you know, widely popular TV series. And in this, the young women who were kind of dressed up and behaving, you know, like Empress would, would say, oh, it's, it's Urjao time. It's time for our Urjao. As if Urjao was like a daily small little cake eaten by these elite empresses that would keep you healthy, keep you fertile, keep you, you know, collagen rich, your skin young. And so on, and it kind of took off from there as a mainstream consumer product. And the Urjao industry has been very innovative, like they're creating different types of products using Urjao. You can have your Urjao as a kind of milk now, I think. You can have it as different types of cakes and powders and so on. So there's even many different ways to consume it as even like a supplement now to what would be a normal product. So, you know, Urjao infused milk might just be collagen improved, fertility improved, aging improved milk. So it's come a long way on the production side and hence then on the marketing side. And so from 2010, this shortage of donkey hide itself. It's very interesting for me to look at it in the context of Africa-China trade. It seems kind of like an interesting kind of example of some of the wider kind of problems in the trade relationship. You know, so as you say, it's a relatively contained industry, right? Kind of like it's mainly located in one province, it's mainly located among just a few big players. In theory, it would have been relatively easy to work out some kind of arrangement that wouldn't then lead to widespread massive kind of immiseration of the poor you know in africa but somehow it then immediately moved into kind of uh, like this convoluted illegal trade and like very very kind of different reactions from different governments and and, and so on like you know I, I was wondering like what do you think it reveals about africa china trade more broadly yeah, wow. So I did my PhD thesis even on China-Africa trade in Beijing. And when I learned about this donkey trade, like you, I was like, wow, that just seems the most epic, this ancient donkey and such dramatic different uses for the donkey and such different perceptions of the uses and the value of the donkey even. And, you know, at one end, a, a living support means for the poorest, which it also was back in the day in China, even if not to the same extent. And, you know, now in China, just an input to an amazing consumer product. And so indeed it does. I mean, I don't think you can compare it to something like 
oil, which, you know, it's oil is known at both ends. It's used the same way at both ends. Oil dominates China-Africa trade. And it's hard even to compare it to anything like, you know, South Africa exporting beef or sesame seeds from Tanzania. They may have impacts where sesame seeds or beef become more expensive here. But the demand, I think the thing about the donkey trade is that it's not a sophisticated industry at this end, and it's not easy to turn it into one. So if donkeys could be turned into pigs, you know, as in by the way they breed, then this donkey trade might be easy to facilitate. And in in any case, that would also mean China could breed many donkeys of its own. So I think the uniqueness of this donkey story is that it's like this ancient, informal, pastoral animal in Africa, and it was even the donkey was first domesticated in East Africa. So the use of the donkey by humans dates back to East Africa. It's not an East Asia story or a Central Asia story. It's an East Africa story. And then by today, it still actually plays that role. You know, it supports communities, mostly not everywhere, like not in, you know, rainforest or tropical kind of temperature areas, mostly in areas that are not densely populated and are quite arid. So that's a lot of East Africa, some parts of Central Africa and some parts of West Africa, the kind of remoter areas and a little bit in urban centers by the poor. So I think it's like I, the paper I published for Sire. You know, I called it putting the cart before the donkey as in the cart before the horse or, you know, keeping the cart after the donkey. And I, I think there's just this gap of the industry in China is the Urjiao industry is, is an $8 billion industry. It's very mechanized, very sophisticated, brilliant marketing campaigns. You know, it's all but a first world type huge industry. And the donkey industry, so to speak, in Africa is not. It's donkeys are bred when they're not being used for working, they're allowed to produce one or two foals in their lifetime. And it's mostly a rural and informal and small scale affair. And efforts to turn it into a large scale affair, even in China, are proving very, very difficult. So it's such an amazing nexus in China-Africa trade. I think it is almost hard to compare with anything for the different values, religious angle, you know, it has like, I was a speaker at the Pan-African Donkey Conference in Dar es Salaam in December. And this was an effort by the African Union, the relevant parts of um, the Tanzanian government and some regional organizations in Africa to try to create a consensus on how to manage this trade because some countries, including Tanzania, had banned it because of the problems with the illegal trade. They tried a formal trade, but the illicit one made it impossible. But then their donkeys were still being stolen across the border to other countries. So for all its efforts to regulate the donkey trade, Tanzania failed. And so then there was this bigger effort where we need to have a continental approach or these donkeys will just get stolen across borders. And that was an effort to kind of bring that together to get a systematic approach. But as you said, there's just like Kenya has abattoirs that have won a legal right to keep selling donkeys despite the illegal trade. In Tanzania, they've been banned, but the illegal trade goes on. It's very hard to get an agreement that seems to work for everyone. And the losers of that are Africa's poor and women and girls especially. Yeah, and it's fascinating how these kind of criminal networks, similar to wildlife smuggling, just kind of jump into existence. And another thing that that always also fascinates me about this is how it's such a highly gendered trade. You know, it's like so highly gendered on the Chinese side in relation to fertility and skin beauty and, you know, kind of ancient femininity and conspicuous consumption, but then also on the African side in relation to female labor. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weirdly very profound topic that touches a lot of issues. Profound is the right word. Just amazing as an excess, you know. Uh, it almost represents, n- not empowerment because it's about beauty and so on, but to some extent empowerment of these new incomes that Chinese people have and you know, buying these very, in some cases, extremely expensive products. But indeed, at this end, it's the complete opposite. It's the poorest and neediest people who, you know, have for thousands of years used this donkey to support 
their basic means and their basic living standards. So at this Pan-African Donkey Conference, you know, some of the speakers they were kind of bereft and no one was actually critical of China. Like nobody was critical of the fact China uses donkeys for this product and, and its logic. They just simply were trying to work out how to keep enough donkeys for themselves. And they thought, but, but our, our wives are becoming the donkey again. You know, I just never forgot that phrase. I, like, I mean, they didn't literally mean their own wife, but they meant collectively wives in rural Africa were becoming the donkey again. And they were sort of grieved by that, like bereft. And yet, as you just said, in China, it's this new privilege, new wealth, new, it's just the most amazing nexus. And one that's incredibly hard to kind of find, you know, China on the illegal wildlife trade, and I'm sure you've had a few podcasts on that over the years, managed a kind of agenda. They used celebrities. I think it was Folk Act 2015. They really put some effort into winding down some aspects or trying to limit even demand in China for all those products, for ivory and so on. Ideally, maybe they can do the same with donkeys, just because it's doing so much damage to people who, you know, China's trying to foster this massive agricultural trade push. It wants to foster poverty alleviation in China. And this donkey trade just goes against all of those things, even the environment. You know, the donkey doesn't require oil imports. It doesn't require foreign currency. It's very, very sustainable over long distances in droughts and so on. So it's the most climate change friendly form of transport there is. So to sabotage that role goes against so much China, Africa, political economy agenda. So I hope they can find a way to work between some of these livestock charities, some of these donkey charities, the African Union Livestock Department, which arranged this event. Like I said, even the Tanzanian prime minister even came to this event. It's, it's a big deal. It's donkeys, but the prime minister was there. And, you know, the archbishop of Tanzania was there to capture that divine angle. Like the speech of the archbishop was titled something like, the divine value of the donkey, you know, this which it doesn't have the same resonance in China. But maybe there's a way to learn from efforts that have been successful in China to diminish that wildlife demand to somehow bring donkey demand or at least demand for Africa's donkeys into something that works for both ends because it just has such a chance to spill over and undermine so much of the rest, you know, just so counterproductive for both. Exactly. It's this interesting kind of, you know, rescuing defeat from the jaws of victory kind of dilemma, you know, kind of where in theory, there is the potential for some kind of trade, but in reality, it just you know, it just goes so badly wrong. So one of the recommendations you make in the article is that, you know, is, is for agile kind of certification measures and that there is the opportunity or that there is a possibility of donkey containing agile and non donkey containing agile. So I was wondering, you know, kind of like that kind of distinction is are, are we are we seeing the the possible kind of emergence of a kind of a very high end kind of like a luxury market akin to something like very rare tea for example in in, in china in you know kind of special like certified you know kind of donkey containing agile compared to a more mass market product for example or like what are some other ways to not only to make the trade more sustainable but in you know kind of possibly even kind of having some kind of revenue being funneled back to africa i think there is already that elite product and it's nothing to do with the sustainability or that value side it's for example it would be made from black donkey in Shandong so there is already differentiated products for urja and I think that's really what type of product it is the type of donkey you know all this so so there's a lot of differentiated urja products already what there isn't for example is like a sustainable donkey brand, you know, more like sustainable fishing or sustainable or a donkey farmed urja brand, which, you know, may or may not, it's like donkey farmed fish that may or may not add to the value, you know, donkey farmed donkeys may not be considered to offer the same properties. I have, since I wrote that paper, I've come into contact with a German scholar in Australia at Sydney University who specializes in traditional Chinese medicine and urja. So she knows a lot about the very specifics 
of the urja industry, which I'm, I know more about China-Africa trade and its role in, in that capacity. There are people who say there are donkey substitutes so that to get those benefits of the collagen, the aging, all the rest, that you don't need to use the donkey hide. And what I understand is the donkey hide is used because the not only for its collagen type, but the donkey itself in Chinese culture is yin. It's not yang, like the horse is yang, a kind of aggressive, energetic animal used in wartime. And the donkey is yin. It's more calm. It's more soft. It's So it's even the yin properties of the donkey as to why it must be the donkey and not another animal. And I, I think the challenge is the tradition. Like the value of Urjau is in this 3,000-year-old donkey hide tradition. So there are many ways in theory to get the same health properties that are associated with Urjau from other products, but they don't have the kind of cachet and the cultural tradition and the kind of royal marketing and long-established culture of Urjau. So how to merge that ancient culture with a sustainable consumption of donkeys. So the Urjau industry is trying to breed donkeys within China. They still take some donkeys from small scale farms in kind of Qinghai and Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, the like low population density areas where they can breed donkeys and they still use them a bit. But they also have these super intensive high-tech IVF using techniques like as modern. There was a, an Irish vet who specializes in donkeys and donkey reproduction speaking at the Pan-African Donkey Conference. And he's visited those farms and he's seen a lot of the technology and so on. And China's trying to create a setting whereby donkeys can be bred much faster, but it's or at least many more of them. But it's so far proving difficult and itself might be quite challenging for the donkeys involved. So there are efforts to try to diminish the need for African donkeys without without diminishing the consumption of donkeys. But it seems there'll be a gap in between. And what Africa worries is that the gap will see African donkeys kind of gone before China works that out. Well, exactly. Kind of in closing, I wanted to ask you, what do you think African governments should do? Is it the best kind of move towards trying to ban the trade on their side? Like, what would you recommend African governments' next step should be? So the Pan-African Donkey Conference, which was mostly real true donkey experts, not China-Africa experts, they called for a 10 to 15 year moratorium on the trade so that regulations could be set up. The donkey registration progress, you know, maybe even marking of donkeys could happen and the supply could be assured. So that was their call. And probably at least there might best be some facilitation into FOCAC of the kind of you know, urge our the donkey side of China-Africa trade. So, you know, whoever are the officials in the FOCAC process working out these agricultural push, they can somehow perhaps add donkeys to that and how to best regulate it and make it something that works for both ends. I think at this coming upcoming China-Africa Economic and Trade Exhibition in Changsha in June, by total coincidence, Shandong is one of the kind of guest provinces. So maybe there's a chance for certain African countries or African industries to really to meet for the kind of African civil society or African donkey whatevers to, to have a conversation with the Shandong representatives there. And, you know, not, not, not in public, not in the media, not high profile, not critical of either side just simply a discussion in Changsha, how can we make this work as a win-win for both sides? So perhaps I hope that the China-Africa Economic and Trade Exhibition and Shandong's role this year might provide a very behind-the-scenes opportunity to facilitate a productive discussion on that that works for both ends. I think there has been, a, as you said, a bit of a, you know, the donkeys serve the poor and the remote. So they're also out of the minds of, of a lot of the officials working in their capital cities on China-Africa issues. 
And then it's very gendered. So it's like a double whammy. It's the poor and it's women. So it doesn't get high up enough. But there's a possibility it has much bigger spillovers on goodwill towards China, goodwill towards a lot of things. And so it might be unexpectedly useful also to address these challenges for both sides. But that would be my first. I hope this year's Kaite can have some way of embedding that discussion into China-Africa economics. And then maybe, I think in Hunan, there's also a China-Africa trade research cluster now in the special kind of economic zone in Hunan for Africa. Maybe there are some researchers there who can start a china specific donkey research with Africa and they can work out and see from the China side what these challenges are in Ethiopia and Kenya and so on and and feed that back into the Chinese system in a way that can communicate this is having negative impacts on China as well as on Africa. This is a better way to optimize the trade and that might lead to something also. The article is China, Africa and the Market for Donkeys, Keeping the Cart Behind the Donkey by Lauren Johnston. And it's up on the South African Institute of International Affairs website. We'll put the link in our show notes. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. If those who want to follow what you're reading and writing, are you on Twitter? Yes, indeed. L.A. Johnston, Dr. D.R. L.A. Johnston, D.R. is my Twitter handle. Thank you so much for joining. It was so fascinating. Thank you so much, Kobus. It was wonderful to be back on the show. Kobus, that linkage with gender is a part of the story that I had never thought about up until now. And it's absolutely fascinating to think that when donkeys are stolen from a farm, that unfortunately it's women that have to then pick up a lot of the work that was done by the animals. And that is, again, it's just, it shows you the layers of tragedy that are unfolding with this. And it's just so infuriating to me that governments in China and in Africa are not doing more to crack down on this because the impact is so acute, so painful, so disproportionate in terms of gender and on rural farmers that nothing is being done is shocking to me. And again, I, when I say nothing's being done, I don't care what anybody says that they're doing something. At the end of the day, this story keeps getting worse and worse. When we go from 1.8 million donkeys in Kenya to 800,000, nothing's being done then. It's just, it's absolutely maddening. It really is very frustrating. And it also shows a lot of these kind of embedded problems that face African governments, even when they try to crack down on this kind of trade. You know, so for example, poaching networks that run across borders are fueled by the fact that many of these borders are very porous and they're not very well, we're very well governed, you know, which then, you know, relates to larger kind of capacity and funding gaps in, in African societies. And so it makes life very difficult for African governments, even the ones who are trying to either, you know, monetize the trade, as some have, or crack down on the trade, both of them face a lot of problems. And with it, then, you also see this problem of once demand takes off in China, once consumer demand takes off in China, it has this kind of weird, you know, kind of like gravitational effect where it, it just like, draws stuff in from around the world. We're seeing it with wildlife trade as well. The, the, you know, kind of uh, like something becoming popular as treatment in China has these knock-on effects around around the world simply because of the scale of the Chinese market. So that then has these massive implications for wild animals, for all kinds of wildlife commodities, and then also on the management structures of global South governments around the world. So it's a, it's a massive challenge. I remember when I was living in China a few years ago, and I asked a friend of mine who bought some Ejiao, you know, did she know about the origins and what went into the product? And she really didn't. And I don't hold it against the Chinese consumer on this, because if we held that standard to every consumer that they need to know the origins of the raw materials that go into making the products they buy, all of us are guilty of horrific things because all of us have a cell phone that has artisanal labor from the DRC included in the mix of the cobalt that is supplied for it and the tin and the tantalum and whatnot, not to mention the clothes and even the food we eat oftentimes comes from substandard labor. There's no shortage of examples of that. So I don't think this is an issue on the consumer level. The frustrating part for me is that there's no coverage that I've seen in the Chinese press and even among China-Africa scholars in China to raise awareness about these issues. Another frustrating part of this is that when you 
talk to stakeholders in the West who are constantly accusing the Chinese of all these things that they're not doing in Africa that we've debunked over and over again. And here you've got an issue where they can crack down. You brought up in a previous show on this topic many years ago that if the Chinese are so good at cracking down on ivory, as they have, very little ivory now gets in through the traditional channels. There's ivory coming over the border from Vietnam into China, but the ivory trade between China and Africa has really gone down considerably. And it's helped the elephant population a lot. In fact, the reduction of the poaching of elephants has even caused some problems in some countries where we now have a boom in the population. So if they can crack down on ivory, we know it's possible. And we know that it's possible. And so you think, why wouldn't they step up to do something on this? And I think it's because of ignorance and the lack of public pressure. So this is one of the issues that if folks who like to criticize China are listening to this show, put this one on your list. And for Chinese stakeholders who really want to do something meaningful to help people in Africa, as often is said, then this is one of the issues that can be addressed right away. Not too difficult. Put it on the list of banned imported products, force the Ujiao industry in China to, to find a synthetic replacement, and off we go. I just, yeah, it's maddening. I mean, I keep saying that. That's the only thing, that's the big word of the day for this show for me, is just maddening. Yeah, I also find it very frustrating, particularly not, not only because donkeys are so important to rural economies in Africa, but also because donkeys themselves are lovely animals and they really are suffering you know, because of this trade. So as you say, there are solutions that people can move towards, but what's needed is political will, particularly, I think, on the Chinese side, you know, in, in coordination. Yeah, but on the African side too. Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't let the African governments off the hook here. Yes. Because I bet you when William Root meets with the Chinese on a number of issues, never once does he bring up donkeys, which he should, because it's having a terrible impact on his rural population. Yeah, they don't tend to choose donkeys to pick a fight over. And, you know, kind of as Lauren also points out, donkeys are climate-friendly technologies. You know, kind of they are climate-friendly solutions to a, to a whole bunch of big problems in Africa. So there should be more donkeys, not fewer. And, you, you know, kind of that alone is already a, a reason to crack down on this trade. And if you're interested in this broader issue of the role of donkeys, not just in Africa, but also Again, in other parts of the world, there's a fantastic organization based out of the UK called the Donkey Sanctuary that does really great reporting on this. They raise money. They're, they're you know, doing a lot in the, in the form of education and outreach. So we'll put links to the Donkey Sanctuary. We'll also put links to all of Lauren's reports in the show notes as well. An absolutely fascinating interview that you had with Lauren. Thank you so much, Cobus, for doing that. We're going to keep on the donkey issue. And we've been we've done at least four or five shows on this, and we're going to do more because we just can't state enough how important this is to rural populations, particularly women in Africa and elsewhere in the global south. And again, it's something that can be fixed. And the Chinese need to take more seriously, and African governments need to take more seriously as well. So let's leave our discussion there. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast. For Cobus van Staten in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, Check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.